Hey everyone, it's Victoria with Nutrition by Victoria. Welcome to today's video. So I have been asked to <clears throat> analyze Dr. Peter Rogers as he has been talking about fructose and how it makes us sick and fat. So uh, thank you so much for joining me today. For those of you who don't know me, I have a master's of science degree in human nutrition, and I specialize in helping you to eat in a way that builds a high functioning metabolism so you can be lean, fit, and healthy for life. So uh, with that said, um, I actually did an interview with Dr. Peter Rogers, where we went over this exact topic. So in today's video, I'm going to be showing you where I uh, talked about that already with Dr. Rogers, what study I referenced, and if my opinion about fructose has changed. So let's get right into it. So this is going to be a very science-oriented video, so I hope that you enjoy. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we are going to get started with Dr. Rogers' um, take on fructose metabolism. <clears throat> the unique thing about fructose is when it's metabolized in the liver, it hits glycolysis, the metabolism pathway for sugars, the anaerobic metabolism pathway for sugars. It hits it at the midpoint. At the three now, glycolysis is not just the anaerobic pathway for glucose metabolism where it gets converted into energy. It is the anaerobic and aerobic pathways. So uh, glycolysis feeds anaerobic respiration and aerobic respiration. Okay which would be the Krebs cycle. So glucose, here's glucose coming in, let's say through the hepatic artery. It'll come in and it'll be phosphorylated. And then the key point is this PFK. PFK is phosphocortokinase and that's a highly regulated enzyme. So that's a big deal. Basically, the liver is very skilled at handling glucose. It only burns it for energy when it needs energy. It does not want to waste any glucose. The main job of the liver is making sure the brain has enough glucose so that PFK is tightly, tightly regulated in multiple ways. All right, so nothing happens with glucose unless the liver has a good reason and wants it to happen. It's not like that with fructose. With fructose, you can get a bolus of fructose hitting the liver and then it, 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 it comes into the cycle, the glycolysis cycle of reactions at the midpoint at the three. Okay, so um, this is the liver absorbing fructose. So glucose metabolism and fructose metabolism are different in that glucose needs insulin in order to get into the cells. So it is used by the muscle cells. Okay, glucose is our main form of fuel. Okay, so even fructose has to get converted into glucose for it to be utilized in the ATP cycle, uh, in the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle. Um, but fructose doesn't need insulin to be absorbed. So it can actually be quite insulin um, friendly in terms of if you're somebody who uh, is moving towards insulin resistance to insulin sensitivity, because fructose requires less insulin to be utilized. And that's because it gets, you eat it, it goes into your blood, it, it gets transported through the portal vein and into the liver for utilization. Three carbon phase. So it starts out, glucose and fructose start out as six carbon sugars, but then they get, you know, the fructose gets chopped in half and becomes a three- for those of you who want a very brief biochemistry session, uh, <laughs> glucose and fructose are enantiomers of each other, so they're mirror images. Carbon sugar, and then it speeds on down to the end of the pathway. It'll form pyruvate, then something called acetyl-CoA, which is a two-carbon unit, uh, like acetic acid, like vinegar, you know, and the two-carbon unit is then run through the Krebs cycle and then run through the mitochondria. Um, electron transport chain and what's called oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP. That's how the vast majority of energy is made in the human body. Okay, what's relevant about it though is fructose, it uniquely just goes right to the liver 
and then hits the three carbon phase. There's no significant regulatory steps at this point, and it makes too much. So what we're getting at is now the Dr. Peter Rogers is saying that we make too much acetyl CoA when we have fructose and glucose fueling the Krebs cycle for energy creation is sub a subjective statement. So this is his theory, in other words. Yeah. Normally, if you eat a fruit, that's a small amount of fructose, maybe about five grams. And there's a whole bunch of things to slow it down. The, the, the peel has to be removed. There's a lot of fiber in the fruit. There's other things about the fruit that are going to protect it from having any type of significantly negative effect. Okay, we'll talk about those more a little later. Um, you know, the fact that it has vitamin C, the fruit has potassium, uh, has magnesium. All of those things are going to help make fruits much, much different than eating high fructose corn syrup. Okay, but let's say you guzzle down soda pop and there's lots of high fructose corn syrup in there. And high fructose corn syrup, it can be like 65% uh, fructose and the rest glucose. High fructose corn syrup is generally a 50-50 split of fructose and glucose. Sometimes there's a little bit more fructose. Maybe it's like 60-40, you know, 55-45, but generally it's the same as table sugar, which is like a which is a 50-50 split of glucose to fructose. So high fructose corn syrup is very similar. It's very rare that you're going to be consuming high fructose corn syrup in a state where fructose is um, exponentially higher in percentage in comparison to glucose. And no one is ever consuming just pure fructose. <laughs> Um, anyways, it will come into the liver and when it's phosphorylated, the phosphorylation process, because it keeps happening so rapidly can lead to, you know, using up much of your ATP and this ADP that's, you know, the, the end product after you've given off a phosphate to phosphorylate fructose will then get metabolized into what is called uric acid. And that's real important is that uric acid gets released back into the blood and it's going to have major effects on our metabolism. Okay. Also... Now, I just want to mention that I have read blood work <laughs> regularly done and I have, um, you know, since I've been pregnant and everything, um, just having blood work done. Uric acid levels show in a um, complete metabolic panel. Okay, so I have never had uric acid levels elevated in any of my blood work. So just something to keep in mind as a person who has regularly consumed, um, a diet based on fruit with the addition of simple sugars for the last 13 years. I'm sorry. It's a CBC that, uh, can check your uric acid levels, which I've had done so regularly with all my pregnancies and with my most recent physical that I had done in October. And every single time my uric acid level has always come back normal, despite a diet based on fruit and sugar added as well. So I guess the moral that I'm trying to get to is that if somebody is not insulin resistant, will they have a buildup of uric acid from fructose metabolism show up on a CBC? Um, I really think that the problem with fructose metabolism and uric acid buildup comes down to what else that person is eating and their level of insulin sensitivity. So I think that fatty liver disease, which is basically what we're getting at here with talking about the subject, and it's a cause for concern for many people as uh, fatty liver disease is considered to be, you know, diabetes of the liver. Uh, which would suggest that there's insulin resistance 
at play. So is fructose metabolism impaired the same as glucose metabolism when the diet is insufficient in carbohydrate intake or you know, glucose, sugar intake, which is glucose and fructose, and uh, contains a high amount of fat. That would be my theory, okay? All of this uh, end product of glycolysis comes into the liver, and the liver has nothing to do with it. It's like, hey, I didn't order this. Why, don't you, why are you giving me all this pyruvate, all this acetyl-CoA? Let's just make it into fat. So, okay. So, <laughs> pyruvate is the um, starting material for the TCA cycle. And um, it makes what is known as acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA can have a number of fates. All right. So I'm going to show you guys one of my charts here. You'll see that acetyl-CoA is in a box because of its significance here. Pyruvate creates acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can also be contributed via fatty acids. Acetyl-CoA can also be turned into ketone bodies. Acetyl-CoA can also be turned into fatty acids, um, but it is the starting material for the TCA cycle, which is this cycle right here that generates ATP, aka our energy metabolism, okay? Ideally, you want to be running glycolysis, which is where glucose, this is glycolysis right here, where glucose is turned into pyruvate. Um, pyruvate creates this acetyl-CoA. In order to keep the Krebs cycle running smoothly, uh, you need oxaloacetate to combine with acetyl-CoA to run the entire process. And oxaloacetate is contributed via pyruvate, which is ideally being created from glucose. So really, you know, uh, <laughs> we're going to be getting into all kinds of topics, but <clears throat> fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate. And the reason why is because you need this oxaloacetate, which is, um, created from pyruvate to combine with acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA is basically going to be the, <clears throat> material, the starting material for your TCA cycle. And you need to have enough of this in order to run the cycle. And so the faster your metabolism is, the higher your metabolic rate, the more acetyl-CoA you're going to need, and the more oxaloacetate you're going to need in order to keep that cycle running quickly. So when we encounter uh, periods of calorie restriction, carbohydrate restriction, the first thing to go is oxaloacetate. So the drop in oxaloacetate is what triggers gluconeogenesis to get started um, so that we can keep the TCA cycle running accordingly. Once um, we start running out of glucose or we're running gluconeogenesis for long enough, about 48 hours, we start creating ketone bodies from acetyl-CoA, from the acetyl-CoA buildup. So because we're not regenerating oxaloacetate or we're not creating oxaloacetate, enough of it from pyruvate, we um, slow the cycle down. We get a buildup of acetyl-CoA and because there's a need for energy coming from the cells and the body being like, hey, we're having a problem. There's low energy availability here. We start to create ketone bodies and enter into ketogenesis and ketosis. So a lot going on with everything that I just said, but essentially the important things to keep in mind here is that different, um, states, whether we're fed or fasted, whether we're in a famine, whether we're in a, on a diet, whether we're, you know, following a low carb diet, whether we're practicing calorie restriction, whether we're eating a high carb diet with a high fat intake, like these are all very important, um, to take into consideration when it comes to our ability to, uh, generate energy in our cells. So a high functioning metabolism 
is going to mean that you have insulin sensitivity, which means that you are quickly converting what you eat, the glucose that you consume into fuel. Okay. And any spillover is going to glycogen. And then you're also down regulating, uh, Glucone or you're also down regulating de novo lipogenesis. Why am 